I hope everybody's doing good. Hey, can we, look, we got something special today. Can we welcome in Jasper and Arab? They're watching with us, all three campuses today. Golly, we, look, we're, gonna, we're just going to have a Sunday where we just practice. We're just going to come in here and we're going to practice, like, giving, giving. Look, it's hard being up here by yourself. It's like, it's scary. Me and Jesus, and it's hard. I need help. Listen, so, hey, Jasper, uh, A-Rab, we're so glad you're watching. Listen, I really believe God's going to speak to us today. We're so excited. We're in our third week of our series in Ecclesiastes, doing a study of Ecclesiastes. Uh, we've been talking about, would you relive the life you're living? And so, listen, let me, let me just give you a heads up of what's going to happen today, okay? Last week, I kind of left you a cliffhanger, told you you need to come back. Uh, we're talking about Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and, and we're talking about pain today and, and how to deal with it. And I'll be honest with you, I sat down, studied, did some stuff, got all kinds of notes, got some, got some things that I was ready to, to present to, to Jake and Adam because we meet together on Tuesdays and go through our sermons and just let them know this is the direction we're going to go. And, and so uh, they came in and I started laying all kinds of stuff out to them. I'm like, this is what Ecclesiastes 3 is saying. This is what I think is really cool. It's, what do you think? And all of a sudden, Adam Hicks started spewing just gold, like, I mean, like incredible words from God. And I was like, uh, that's absolutely incredible. See, I think a lot of people in here may know, maybe, uh, maybe a lot of you do not know, but Adam's gone through a lot in his life. But uh, this last year, Adam went through a divorce. It was something that was unexpected. It was something that he was not wanting. Uh, he fought for it, did everything he could, but it didn't turn out the way he wanted it to. And so there's a lot of places in the last year that he's gone through a lot of pain. And so he was just spewing out this stuff because he's going from the overflow of his heart that was 100 times better than anything that I would ever say. And I was like, hey, here's the deal, here's the deal, dude. Here's the dude deal. I, I said, here's the big picture. Uh, I need you to speak this week, and I want you to speak to all campus because our whole entire church needs to hear what you've got to say because what he's got to say is absolutely incredible. He's got some other things that he's going to say uh, you know, that, that's happened in his life also. You know, one of my, my, one of my big things in, uh, you know, when we planted Desperation Church, one thing I always said is I'm not going to shoot our wounded. I'll never shoot the wounded. As a matter of fact, I want to do everything I can to rebuild, revive, and restore wounded people because everybody in this room has be, been wounded before. And so when something like this happens with, with one of my best friends and one of our pastors at our church, I'm not going to shoot my wounded. I'm going to do everything I can to restore him, love him, and help him walk through it. And so I don't know how spiritual you are, but God healed people emotionally, physically, and spiritually, and that's what we're here to do, all right? And so... I want y'all to give it up. Can you stand up and give it up for my good friend and pastor, Jasper Campus, Adam Higgs. Give it up. Desperation Church, do you love Jesus? Awesome. Y'all can sit down. Y'all can sit down. Jasper Arab, what's up? Jasper, I love you so much. And uh, I will be back with you next week. And uh, listen, I want you to know just real quick, all three locations before we get into the message today, that we would not, you would not be sitting in the seat that you're sitting in. Your life would not be changed the way that it is. God would not be moving the way he was if it wasn't for one man's yes, that man's yes, nine years ago to Jesus. When God called him to Coleman, Alabama to plant a church, now we're in Jasper, Arab, soon to be North Jefferson. Anybody excited about four locations coming up? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, listen, uh, we are uh, in, a, in a series called Would You Relive the Life That You Are Living? And uh, you can go ahead and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, pull up your Bible app. But I just want to share something with you before we get into the text. Um, 2018 was uh, a very, very painful time for my family and I. I took uh, four months off to heal, absorb the shock, walk closely to our pastor and overseers, uh, went uh, through counseling and plugged into community groups. Um, something you also need to know is that 2018 was also very fulfilling because it was in my deepest pain that I experienced a nature of God that I had never experienced before uh, in my life. My heart has been from the beginning to love my babies allow God to lead me throughout this process and heal my emotions, to walk in complete forgiveness. And as a pastor at Desperation Church, uh, I expect our church to do the same and to move forward. Will you move forward with me? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. And today, I can honestly say, before God, as God is my witness today, because of a process that I went through and made myself go through, my emotions are totally and completely healed. Just as God can supernaturally heal a body, 
because you're three parts, he can supernaturally heal your broken soul. Okay, and so today we're gonna talk about how to process pain uh, correctly. And so if you got your Bibles, you can pull this up. I'm gonna read uh, through Ecclesiastes and we're just gonna kind of break this down for a little bit. And then I've got some points I wanna share with you. Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse one through 13. It says, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And so Solomon is basically saying that everything in life is seasonal. You're gonna experience good seasons and bad seasons. He's saying that life is a roller coaster. And so there's good times, which I don't think we have an issue processing, but then there's the bad times that can end up living with us for the rest of our life if we don't handle it correctly. Solomon goes on to say in uh, verse nine, he says, what do people really get for all their hard work? I have seen the burden God has placed on us all, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has placed eternity in the human heart, but even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. So he's basically saying that we are eternal beings that live inside of time. God is an eternal being that doesn't live in time. And so he basically can look at our lives personally and he knows everything from the time you were born to the time that you die. He knows everything that you're going to do. And he also knows everything that we are going to go through. But we live inside of time. And so when we encounter pain, it causes us to ask a lot of questions because we don't see it coming. And we'll get to those questions in just a few minutes. He goes on to say in verse 12, he says, so I concluded that there's nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor for these are gifts from God. So he goes from saying that life is a roller coaster, good times and bad, you're gonna go through things. And because you live inside of time and you encounter pain, you encounter those seasons, you're not gonna really know what to do with it. And then he just makes it up in his mind in verse 12. Like, so I just decided, you know, no matter what, just to be happy. Just to be happy and just enjoy life. And man, that's just, that's just what we're gonna do. Yippee, yay, okay, yay, you know? And so, and so he does that. And my question is though, if Solomon was sitting here, cause I know he's wise, I know he's got all the money, okay? I know he's, he's married, uh, you know, and has, you know, all of that stuff. But listen, my question would be if I was sitting face to face with Solomon, it would be, okay, so I get that and I get the good seasons and I get, you know, processing that and ending up in this place where, man, I'm just happy and content with life. But what did you do with the bad times, Solomon? How in the world did you get to verse 12 where you concluded for yourself that there is nothing better than just to be happy and enjoy life? How did you become so content with life when life was a roller coaster? How did he get there? Better yet, how do we get there? How do we get to the place in verse 12 where we, no matter what we've been through, no matter what season we've been through, where we can be happy and content and live a fulfilled life? How do we get to the place where we're not dictated by the worst seasons of our lives? You know, I've heard a lot of people say in their lives that, that man, my, my painful experiences, my painful seasons have shaped my life and created me to be the person I am today. And I love that, it's a great say, uh, saying, but I beg to differ with you. It wasn't your painful experiences that shaped your life, it was your response to those painful experiences that shaped your life. You see, we have to respond to pain correctly because here's the deal, when pain hits us personally, We've got two choices, there's no gray areas. We can either get better or we can get bitter. We can either get better or we can get bitter. The ball is really in our court, better or bitter. And just like with a physical wound, I don't know um, if you've ever been cut, but uh, I'm sure all of us have unless you just live in a bubble. But, but with a physical wound, if you do not address the wound properly, the way it should be handled, what'll happen? It'll get infected. 
And then you'll get sick and become septic. It's the same way with emotional ones. If we do not handle it correctly, our emotions, our soul will become infected and sick. And it will also infect our relationships, our marriages, our friendships. Everything in our present and future will be dictated by the pain in our past if we don't deal with it correctly. And so today I'm gonna teach you how to process pain the right way. And um, it doesn't matter what cuts you here today. Okay, you're cut. It doesn't matter if somebody posted something negative about you on social media. If you struggle with infertility, if you've been through divorce, if you've experienced infidelity, if your parents divorce, if you've been bullied, it doesn't matter. If we do not deal with it the correct way, we can get emotionally infected. And so I wanna preach to you from the subject today, seasons have reasons. Seasons have reasons. And if I could put my message in a sentence, it would be this, your pain will never be wasted. Your pain will never be wasted. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. And God, we thank you so much for your presence, God, that is so rich and thick and tangible in this house. Father, I pray, God, today that no man or no woman walks out of those doors the same way they walked in, God. I pray, God, against um, just the way the enemy would use pain to filter this message, Lord. And Father, I just pray, God, that hearts will receive, God, what you are calling us to do. And I pray, God, that every single person in this room that has ever dealt with pain, God, begin to take steps towards healing today. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. Hey, real quick, at all three locations, you can raise your hand, but just got a couple of questions just real quick. How many in this room have ever had a dream before? Like when you went to sleep, you had a dream? Some of y'all don't dream, what's wrong with you? Okay, all right, how many in this room have ever had a nightmare? Nightmare, okay, all right, third question. Who in this room, who at Arab, who in Jasper, you've had a nightmare in public? Oh my goodness, man, we could be friends, start a small group, okay. All right, so uh, uh, community group. I'm not doing 10 push-ups. That's the rule we got, okay? I'm not doing it. All right, so, so anyway, I've had a dream in public, okay? It was back in August. Uh, a few of my buddies um, took me to St. Louis to the 100th PGA Championship, okay? And something that you need to understand about me personally is that I really, really, really love my friends. I love being around them. I will hang out with them every single day. I really, really, really hate golf, though. Okay, if you're a golfer and that offends you, that's fine. Go take it out on the golf course. You're ticked off out there anyways over that little white ball that you can't find. You know what I'm saying? Just stressing out. <laughs> it don't even make you sweat. What's wrong with you guys? So anyway, so just come back next week. Pastor Andy loves golf. And so anyway, they were taking me there. And uh, before we went, I called Pastor Andy because I said, dude, we're going to this PGA championship and I need a goofy golf outfit. And I know you have a ton of them. And so, and so I need to come and try on some clothes. And he, man, he hooked me up with all the, you know, the tight shorts and the, and the tuck your shirt in and the white belt. And I was a golfer, man. I, was, I looked the part, you know. And so anyway, we pull up in St. Louis and one of my buddies um, uh, got us this Airbnb. How many stayed in an Airbnb before? They're usually pretty cool. Um, this, one, uh, this one was interesting. Uh, as soon as we walk into the Airbnb in downtown St. Louis, I walk in and the walls, the shelves, the furniture, everything was demonic statues. Like it was all demons. Like, and he was like, guys, it's only 40, $45 a night. You know, it's not a big deal. We're only staying one night. I'm like, 45 bucks, you can spend the night in hell. Okay, that's great. I'm gonna stay here. It'll be awesome. And so, and so we walk in and I'm just weird. I'm just like, my gosh, those things are looking at me. You know, we laid some of them face down and rebuked them in Jesus name. And I don't know what happened. And so uh, when you go upstairs to this Airbnb, uh, I'm not gonna describe all the details of this room. Just know that I ended up, uh, me and Cameron who led worship ended up sharing the bed. The, the rest of the places were futons and we kind of rock, paper, scissors for it. But this bed was round and uh, it had columns and um, like a polar bear rug, like blanket. And uh, so me and Cameron <laughs> just laying there like, man, <sighs> I don't want to know what happened in this room, man. <laughs> but we're sitting there and we're, I'm just incredibly uncomfortable. And um, uh, we had just, went, we went out on the town and explored St. Louis, ate good, uh, had frozen custard and all that stuff, everything St. Louis has to offer. And uh, once we get back to the room, um, I said, hey guys, what time are we waking up in the morning to go, you know, to the championship? And they said, oh man, we're going to wake up about 5.30 in the morning to go watch them tee off. I said, we're going to wake up before the sun comes up to go watch guys hit a golf ball for the first time. That sounds exciting. You know, that sounds great. I'll put on my goofy outfit. I'll be right there. 
And so I'm laying in bed and uh, I'm just sitting there. We're just like, like, I can't sleep. Cameron just rolls over, faces the other way and turns on a sound machine or something. He's out in five seconds. And I'm sitting there like, like, you know, when you see like shadows in your room or something, I'm sitting there, it's dark. I'm in this round bed of polar bear skin and demons are looking at me. So needless to say, I didn't sleep that well, okay? And, and so the next morning we wake up, 5.30, before the sun comes up, we take the bus to the, uh, to the, to the championship and we get there and there's some things that you need to know about me because I don't really like golf. I didn't understand golf etiquette. Okay, so things you need to know is like, yeah, you gotta dress nice in the goofy outfits and all that stuff and the white belt. But then there's these other things. Like, you've gotta be quiet. <laughs> like, you can't really talk. Like, when people are teeing off, you, like, you can't talk. And then the second thing is, like, there's nowhere to sit. Like, all these people stand all day and they just walk in, they're walking over just, man, the excitement of somebody hitting a golf ball, you know? And so um, the fourth thing, or the third thing that I didn't, um, I didn't know, and like you golfers knew this, but like, I didn't know, I didn't know that we were gonna be there for 10 hours. I thought we were gonna be there for two hours. What is wrong with people, you know? <laughs> And so anyway, uh, fast forward a little bit of time, you know, we're going from hole to hole and man, it's awesome. And all my friends are like, man, that was awesome, man. My heart's just beating out of my chest. Cameron loves Tiger Woods. And he was just, hey, Tiger, 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 you know. And I'm just like, man, what is wrong with you guys? And anyways, about 1130, we're sitting at a par three, we're watching a few pros come through. And um, I'm sitting kind of on a hill. I've got two of my buddies uh, on each side of me. And um, I just decide, you know, it's 1130. I need a little break and there's no seats. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit down for a minute. And as I was sitting there and as they were teeing off, man, this breeze like just came across my face. It started feeling good. It wasn't hot anymore. And I just thought to myself, okay, I'm not in Jasper. I'm not in Coleman. I'm not in Arab. I'm never gonna see these people again in my life. And so I'm gonna just lay back on this grassy knoll <laughs> for a little bit. And so I lay down uh, just right there in the middle of everyone. And I'm surprised I didn't end up on Sports Center. but I lay down and I fall into the deepest sleep because I didn't sleep good the night before. And I didn't just fall into the deepest sleep. I, I, I started dreaming and it wasn't a regular dream. It was a nightmare, okay? And, and so basically the dream went is that we were driving down the interstate in the van that we drove to St. Louis in. Cliff is driving, uh, Cliff Hill is driving the van. And uh, I mean, he just got his eye on the road. He's always safe, got his hands in the 10 and two o'clock position. And he's just looking at the road. I look up a about a hundred yards ahead of us and there's cones going all the way across the road blocking traffic. There's nobody between us and the cones, but Cliff is still going, okay? I look at the cones, Cliff hits the accelerator, he's still looking. I look at the cones, I look at Cliff, he's not slowing down, look at the cones. And just before we hit the cones, I scream, watch out for the cones! <laughs> Only it wasn't just in my dream. But you know, like when you're speaking, you think you're speaking English in your sleep, but you're really not. It's more like, what's up with the car? You know, like, and all my friends, I, I'm sure everybody thought I was just wasted because I was laying down. <laughs> all right. But I had my two friends, like when I sat up, I was like, I looked at my buddies. I said, was that loud? And they said, yeah, yeah. I'm surprised we didn't get kicked out, which would have been awesome. And so, <laughs> hey, listen, I, <laughs> One of the greatest feelings in the world, I just had a bad dream this week, but one of the greatest feelings in the world is when you have a nightmare and it's so real and so vivid and then you wake up from that nightmare, you're sweating, your heart's beating, but you look around and the world is just as it should be. Is that not the best feeling ever? Like, man, it was, and you said to yourself, it was just a dream. Have you ever been through a season in your life that was so real and so painful that you would give anything to wake up from it and the world be just as it should be. You ever been there? The world be the way that it used to be. I have too. You know, painful seasons are difficult because we can't wake up from them. And the deal is, is that we're all gonna encounter pain in our life. Jesus said that pain is inevitable. In John 16, 33, he said, I've told you this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. There's three things, there, there's a bunch of things that we, that we have in common as humanity, but three things that just off the top of my head that we have in common is that we're all gonna eat food, we're all gonna breathe oxygen, and we are all going to experience pain in our life. 
Every single person will experience this. It's gonna happen. The issue is, I just don't think we really know what to do with pain when it hits us. I mean, we sing about it, we talk about it, we read books about it, we give people advice when they're going through pain, but when pain hits us, we have the potential to lose our minds, right? It makes us crazy sometimes. Something I um, wanna tell you that is a hard truth about your pain today is that God never causes pain. He does allow pain, but he never wastes pain. God, never, God did not cause your pain. He did allow it, but he never wastes it, never wastes pain, if we respond correctly. Too often people allow their painful experiences to control who they become, who they are towards others and who they are towards God. It's as if every relationship in their present and their future is dictated by the pain of their past and God did not call us to live that way. He's got better for us. But listen, when we allow our pain to control us, it can lead, uh, to us, it can lead us in a life uh, filled with anger, resentment, dissatisfaction, toxic relationships and a victim spirit. What I call a victim spirit, a victim spirit is basically where you just get hurt over and over and over again. And you make like this emotional list in your heart of there. Yep, there we go. There's another person that rejected me. There we go. There's another person who talked about me. There's another best friend that turned their back. There's another church that hurt me. Guess I got to go find another one. And all of a sudden, everything about me is everybody else's fault. And I'm a victim. I'm a victim. That's a victim spirit. Now the enemy attack, uses pain to attack us in two very eternal ways. The first way is in our relationship with God. He wants to attack and cloud our relationship with God. The second way that he attacks is our relationships with people, our relationships with people. We have a choice in pain. We have a choice. We can either own our pain for a season or we can let our pain own us for the rest of our life. We can own our pain for a season and go through the process of healing, or we can let our pain own us the rest of our life. The, the ball is really in our court. And to own our painful seasons, we're gonna have to do some things that we don't wanna do. We're gonna have to make some decisions that we don't wanna make. And so today I've got six quick points that I wanna share with you on how to process your pain enjoy life, experience real authentic relationships and get to that place that Solomon was in, that crazy place where he just said, I just decided in my heart to enjoy life. He said, I concluded that there's nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. I want you to write these down in your app notes. You can write them down on it. And listen, I, want, I just wanna tell you before I tell you this, I want all locations to look at me, all locations. If you go through this process and you do the things that you don't wanna do, I'm telling you, there is healing for you on the other side, okay? There is healing for you on the other side, okay? Step one to healing, okay? This is the best, worst advice you will ever hear in your life, okay? It's this, it's feel the pain. The first step towards healing is to choose to feel the pain. Now, I went through uh, high school without any sports-related injuries until my last wrestling match of my senior year. And that's uh, right, sir, don't let the skinny jeans fool you. I will slam you, okay? And so anyway, my last wrestling match of my senior year, and I ended up tearing my labrum in my shoulder. I ended up having to have surgery. And when I was in recovery after my surgery, I heard them talking about physical therapy. And I was thinking, well, you know, I can't really move my shoulder. I'm in here in recovery. You know, I'll probably start physical therapy, you know, next week or so. No, it was the next morning. It was eight hours later. And they put me on this arm bike after my surgery. And I'm literally telling my physical therapist, you don't know what you're doing, sir. I just had surgery yesterday. This is too soon. And I had tears rolling down my eyes. I, and, and he said a sentence, had tears rolling down my face. He said a sentence to me though. He said, he said, man, I know this hurts. He said, but this pain is gonna heal you and make you stronger than you were before. I'll never forget that. How does that apply to us? Sometimes emotional rehab will hurt worse than the original wound, but it'll end up healing you, okay? Sometimes emotional rehab will hurt worse than the original wound, but it will end up healing you. Most of the time, we don't wanna feel the pain though. That's our goal, not to feel pain. Most of the time, what people do is they mask it. 
Emotional pain people wanna mask it. They wanna compartmentalize it. They want to escape it. Listen, I've had so many injuries throughout my life from four-wheeler wrecks. I've got stitch marks all over me. And man, every time I broke a bone or cut myself or something, my, my, my response was always the same. When I got to the hospital, doc, give me something that takes the pain away. Doc, knock me out. I don't wanna feel this. And we did the same thing with emotional pain. We try to escape it. We try to get some sort of relief and we look for anything to relieve our pain. For some people, it's to drink it away. Now, whether you like to have a drink every now and then, whether you struggle with alcoholism or whether you have never uh, tasted alcohol before in your life, when you were in pain, a few too many drinks seem very appetizing because it can help you escape, right? Some of y'all are too saved in here. Y'all like... <laughs> for some people... For some people, it's to use it away. Maybe you've never had an issue with drug addiction. Maybe you have, maybe it was in your past, but man, when pain hits you and it hurts so bad, it's amazing how we can begin to justify our actions to relieve our pain. And we begin to do things that are completely out of character. But listen, all I know is I'm hurting worse than I've ever hurt before. And they said that that will make me feel better. And so I'm going uh, to make that decision. And man, it masks your pain for a little bit. For some people, it's just to like get busy. Just make yourself busy, man. Listen, I know you're hurting. Just keep yourself busy. Keep yourself dove into a, you know, a lot of things. Go hang out with friends, go to work, all of that stuff. And that's great. It sounds like great advice. I've even given that advice before but the issue is, is that it doesn't face and feel the pain. It just masks it. It's always there. For some people, it's to sex it away. You're hurting so bad. Hey, just go hook up. Go hook up with a stranger. Go hook up with somebody. Because the, the feeling, the sexual high that you get, it can help you escape reality for a few minutes. But once it's all said and done and you're driving home, the pain's there. For some people, it's to porn it away. Pornography shocks the system. It, it, the fantasy is so intoxicating that it causes you to escape your reality. Only when it's all said and done, the pain is still there. It, we just wanna escape it, but the longer we try to escape and mask our pain, the longer we will carry it and the longer it will control us. And in an attempt to mask our pain, we've got so many mistakes, maybe even possible addictions behind us that we didn't have before the pain hit us. Are y'all with me? Eventually, we're gonna have to feel it, to feel the pain, whether it's today or 10 years from now. I talk to people all the time who like bash their ex all the time bash their ex as if it just happened. I said, man, how recent was this? Man, how recent was, uh, recent was your divorce? And they say, 11 years. 11 years you have been controlled by your pain and given your life over to your pain? Do you know that God has more for you than that? Do you know that he who angers you controls you? God wants you to be free. He wants you to walk in freedom. He wants you to get to verse 12. We've got to choose to feel the pain. Maybe you're out here today and you're like, okay, Adam, all right, I get it. I get it. I'm gonna take all the mask off and I'm gonna feel the pain. I'm gonna feel the pain. What then? What do I do then? I think the answer is found in uh, Daniel chapter three. Uh, this isn't on the screens and it's not in your app notes. You can go read Daniel chapter three, but I'm about to give you the Adam standard version, the ASV. Okay, you ready? All right, so there were these three guys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, they were some bold dudes, man. They stood for God. They were incredible. And then there was this king named King Nebuchadnezzar. And basically the way the story goes is King Nebuchadnezzar built a gold statue. And he basically told all the masses of people, he said, listen, when the band plays, I need all y'all to bow down to this statue. And if you don't, that, that fiery furnace over there, yeah, we're gonna throw you in it and burn you alive. Deal? Deal? And so naturally the band plays, everybody bows down except three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the king was furious and he goes and he has them, he turns the, the furnace up seven times hotter and throws them into the fire. A few minutes later, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar walks over and he peeps over the edge and he says, wait a second, I threw three people in that fire, but now there's four people in that fire. The fourth one appears to be the son of God. 
Then he goes down and he calls Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out after seeing them walk around with the Son of God in the middle of this fire. He calls them out. And as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out, they literally, when you looked at them, the Bible records that their clothes weren't burnt. They, their skin wasn't burned. The Bible says that they didn't even smell like smoke. It's an incredible story. Go read it today. Now, something I want you to notice about that is that notice God didn't turn the heat down when they got thrown into the fire. Fire hurts, right? It's pain. Notice God didn't turn the heat down. He didn't, you know, turn it into water so it was like they, you know, fell into a swimming pool. He didn't do anything to change the circumstance. Sometimes God doesn't want to take your pain away right away. Sometimes before he takes the pain away, he wants to meet you right in the middle of it. And he meets you right in the middle of it and he says, hey, you know what? I know this is crazy. I know this is literal hell on earth, but guess what? You're still walking around, you're breathing, and you will come out of this untouched because I met you in the middle of it. But notice this real quick, real quick, real quick. Real quick, okay. Notice this, they came out of the furnace and they, they didn't even smell like smoke. They didn't even smell like the fire they had just been in. Do you know how many people walk this earth today and they smell like the fire and the pains that they've been in before? Their entire life, you can hear it. You can hear it in their conversations. You can see it in their relationships. They are still smelling like the fire that they were in the middle of. And as long as we choose to mask it, we will always smell like it. And it will always control us and how we view ourselves, others, and God. And God. When I was nine years old, I personally experienced the pain of sexual abuse. When I had realized what had happened, my first thought was, no one can ever know. So I figured as I grew older that if I was funny enough, if I was, if I was loud enough, man, if I was the guy at the party who would do anything, man, Adam's crazy. If I did that, then everyone would fall in love with that version of me because I didn't want anybody to ever see the broken side of me. I didn't tell anybody for 19 years, 19 years, 19 years I wore a mask. See, if you're here today and you've been masking your pain for a long time, I'm with you, I get it. 19 years I wore a mask. Before I ever shared it, listen, if you've been through that, I'm not saying tell the masses, I'm doing this today because I feel like it can help people, but you do not have to tell a ton of people, but tell somebody, safe. Open up that compartment that you've buried down deep. I walked in shame and fear and torment for a very long time. Listen to me. What do we do when we're wearing a mask? What do we do when we're, when we're trying to escape the pain? Here's what we do. Choose to feel the pain invite Jesus to meet you in the middle of your pain and your pain will never be wasted. Your pain will never be wasted. Are you all with me? All right, that's one. Let's go to two, okay? Point number two, pay close attention to what God is doing. Pay close attention to what God is doing, okay? God can make a reason out of your painful season, okay? There's purpose that can come out of that. Something I need you to know about me is that I have ADHD, and um, some of y'all know that, like obviously. Um, but I have ADHD and, and all I can tell you is that I live a very distracted life and yeah, hyperactivity and I'm kind of the loudest guy in the restaurant, that kind of guy. But the only way that I can describe it to people is that my thoughts and my brain are louder than the words coming out of the mouth of the person in front of me. Somebody get that? Anybody get that at all? Okay. I mean, it's just, it's just how it works. And so I live a very distracted life. Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says this. It says, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. Because we are eternal beings, but we live in time and we don't know what's coming. When pain hits us, when our deepest pain, crazy, hell on earth situations hit us personally, it begs all of us to ask the same question, why? Right? Why? 
Why me? Why them? Why my family? Why my child? What if I would have done this? What if I had just been there? What if? And we live our lives dictated and distracted by questions. Distracted by questions. And here's a a truth that I want you to hear. And you need to hear it for this point to take place in your life. You may live the rest of your life with no real concrete answers to those questions. You see, I don't know if you've ever put a thousand piece puzzle together. Anybody ever done those before? It's good. I couldn't really concentrate in them, but my family did. But um, I had, uh, if you pick up a piece of that puzzle, um, you know that it's, you know, it's a piece. There's a lot of other pieces, but it's a piece of the puzzle. And man, you see that it's a part of something. It could, you know, be a solid color. It could be a part of a building or something. You know, it's a part of something. You just don't know where it fits. This piece alone doesn't make sense. In our lives, we all get a piece of the puzzle and sometimes it doesn't make sense and we don't have all the answers because we live in time. But because God doesn't live in time, he sees the entire big, beautiful picture put together. He knows where your pain fits. He knows how to make sense of it all. So we've got to come to a place in our pain where we understand that we don't understand. But we put our faith in the one who does understand. Instead of going our entire lives distracted by the questions, why, what if, why me, living in emotional ADD, let's try paying attention paying attention to what God is doing because what happens is we end up being distracted by the questions and we end up missing what God is really doing. What is God doing in our pain? Number one, he's teaching you to trust him. He's teaching us actual trust. Do you know that we could spend like like six weeks on a series on trusting God? Why? Because we really don't uh, have to do it very much, right? Right? We're Americans, man. We're in control of everything. We can make things work in our favor. Very rarely do we have the opportunity to know what it means to trust God. It's in pain when you're completely out of control where he teaches you to trust him. Set your eyes on me. He is growing our faith. He is changing our perspective and he is killing fear. He is taking what the devil meant to break you with and using it to build you with. What am I saying? I'm saying that there is training going on in your trial and there's development happening in your disaster. God is doing more than you think he is doing in your life. Don't be distracted by the questions that you may never have answered. Pay attention to what he is building and creating on the inside of you. He's working your pain for your good. That's what he does. He redeems things. That's what God does. We've been redeemed. He takes horrible things and makes them work for our good. It's Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. He causes everything to work together for the good. That word everything in every single language is defined as everything. That's the good times and that's the bad times. He causes everything to work together for our good. You may think it was all for nothing. You may think that the child you lost was for nothing, that the abuse was for nothing, that the three divorces was for nothing. It's not. God is taking what the devil was breaking you with and he's using it to build you with. He's taking the enemy's tools of torment and he's turning them into his tools of transformation, not only for your life, but for everybody else's life around you. That's what he's doing. We've got to pay attention to what God is doing. Are you with me? Okay, I'm hurrying. Point number three. The right voices will lead to the right choices. The right voices will lead to the right choices. I spit my water everywhere. All right, at every location, I want you to look at me. In seasons of pain, it is absolutely crucial that you have the right voices in your life. When you get hurt, when you get hurt, You're gonna have a lot of voices coming at you. You're gonna have the voice of like your emotions. You're gonna have the voice of God. You're gonna have the voice of the enemy. You're gonna have the voice of your family. You're gonna have the voice of your friends. You're gonna have the voices of people who are talking to you, giving you advice through their undealt with pain. The right voices will lead to the right choices. 
Why is this so crucial? Because here's the deal, just real quick. I don't know if you know this. Pain can make us stupid. I've seen amazing people of character, men and women of God who were educated and smart and sophisticated do insane, crazy, out of character things because of their pain. Because of their pain. Pain can make us stupid. Another scary thing in pain is we have a tendency to isolate. I knew personally that I wasn't above that. And so... As soon as we got the news, as soon as I got the news personally, I sat a bunch of my close friends down. I sat our lead team down on our staff and I said, listen, I don't know how dark this is gonna get, but I sat on the other side of the table with people for so long that, that I know that I'm not above anything personally. I don't know how hard this is gonna get. I don't know what this journey is about to look like, but what I do know is I'm gonna filter every single decision through all of you. And I'm gonna keep everything personally in the light with all of you. There will be nothing in the dark with me. I'm going to expose and confess every deep, dark desire, temptation, and sin in my life. I am an open book because I will not let the enemy isolate me in my pain. I will not let him win me. And so I'm gonna filter everything through you guys. What is that? It's James 5, 16. It's confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. We can get forgiveness from God, but we need healing from one another. We need healing from one another. It's in pain that our convictions tend to loosen. Don't lose conviction in the middle of your catastrophe. The only way to find success in your pain is to continuously tell yourself no and tell God yes. The only way you can do this is with other people. You can't do that alone. You cannot do that alone. So we've got to let safe people in our lives, okay? That's why we do this crazy thing here. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's called community groups. Starts February 3rd, okay? It's not just like something that we do because we don't do Sunday school and hey guys, let's, do, let's have community groups and man, let's just sit around a campfire and have, no. It is real, authentic relationships, a place where it is okay not to be okay. And you have friends. You have people that hold you up when you can't hold yourself up. I remember when they made the announcement at our Jasper campus and I remember the feeling of wanting to go crawl in a dark hole. You ever been there? Want to go crawl in a hole, cave, never come out? Just need Netflix or something. But I remember, and I remember getting to my house and there was a knock on the door and there were cars in my driveway and there were friends with food. And they said, here's the deal, man. He said, they said, you don't have to be pastor with us. You be Adam and you hurt, you process, you're safe and we have got your back. We're gonna hold you up when you can't hold yourself up. That's community. That saved my life. That's community. Now, the second part of this point real quick there's two parts as far as relationships goes. There's gonna be a time in your pain where people are intentional with you when you've been hurt and people pursue you, they surround you. And then there's gonna come this second part, okay? And I'm talking to somebody in here. I'm talking to somebody at Arab, somebody at Jasper. It's the place in your pain when everyone else forgets the pain you still feel. What do you do then? See, what we have a tendency to do is we have a tendency to do something that I call post-pain isolation. It's after everybody leaves the house, after the family member passes and the food is gone, nobody's really calling, nobody's really showing up. And then we go into this post-pain isolation. What do you do when everybody else forgets the pain that you still feel. What we tend to do is we tend to say, take on that victim spirit. Nobody calls me anymore. Nobody checks on me. I mean, I just, and we begin to take on the identity of our wound and we blame everybody else for why we still feel this way. What happens when everybody forgets the pain that you still feel? What do you do? These are the things that you don't wanna do. Get up, get out of bed, Fight, fight, fight through the depression. Take a shower, go to the gym, go to church, go to serve days, go to the movies. Why? Because all that matters in your pain, whether people are being intentional with you or you're being intentional with other people, is that you have the right voices in your life. You with me? Y'all still with me? Okay, four of you, that's good. All right, number four. This, is, this one's gonna go quick. Focus on what you can control and surrender what you can't. 
Focus on what you can control and surrender what you can't. Listen, we're control freaks, right? And when we lose control, when we're out of control, we go nuts and we lose our entire minds. We lose our minds because we try and control everybody else in our situation when the only thing that we can control, which is us, ends up falling apart in the process. So we try to control and we try to manipulate things in our favor. I don't know if like young people, you've been through a breakup, like she dumped you or he dumped you or whatever. And like your biggest enemy in a breakup is these guys, two thumbs, right? Because you just think, like, I can send that text message and that's gonna bring them back. That one right there, I'm gonna send that song. I'm just gonna let them know, let them know. Maybe it could be that you post on social media something negative about the person who hurt you and uh, to control everybody's per, uh, perception of you and so that everybody will draw horns on the person who hurt you and be on your side. Control. We focus on controlling everyone else, when really all we can really control in our lives is us, is us. Listen, we can't control what happens to us or how people respond, but we can control what happens inside of us. Some things that we're in control of is becoming the best version of ourselves the best version of ourselves, seeking the Lord. Listen, you can't control how they perceive you. You can't control what people say. You can't control lies that people tell about you. You can't control any of that. All you can control is who you are from that day forward. And it's better or bitter. Another thing that you're in control of is this, and this is a difficult one, is choosing to forgive. If you're gonna walk in freedom, this is gonna be the step that's gonna break a lot of things off of you. Forgiveness does not okay what happened to you. Forgiveness does not make it right. It's not right and it never will be. But forgiveness sets you free of their control because he who angers you controls you. When you hear their name, does it make you sick? Are you still talking about them? in a negative context? Are you still trying to get everybody to see how horrible they are, that business partner, I can't. To forgive. It's not about whether they deserve forgiveness or not, it's about how much freedom do you really wanna walk in? Because forgiveness sets you free, it releases control. What is true forgiveness? True forgiveness is no longer desiring for the wrong done to you to be corrected. And that takes the Holy Spirit to do that. It's not just something we can do in and of ourselves. We've got to invite the Holy Spirit into our lives and say, listen, I can't do this on my own, but I'm choosing your way. I'm saying no to me and yes to you. I choose to forgive blank. Now take me on the process of healing. There's three people you've got to forgive in pain. Three people. Number one, in our pain, we've got to forgive God. There's people in this room, there's people in Arab, people in Jasper, you may have been through something devastating and you have been so angry at God. We've got to come to a place in our pain where we forgive him. We understand that man, there is a God who loves us and a devil who hates us. God did not cause this, he did allow it, but he's not gonna waste it. God, I choose to forgive you. Number two, we've got to forgive ourselves. You gotta forgive yourself. You gotta let yourself off the hook for being human. You can't change the past. You can't change the mistakes that you have made. Jesus said this. He said to love your neighbor as you love yourself. You can't love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. And you can't forgive your neighbor if you don't forgive yourself. If you don't forgive yourself. Isn't it amazing how that's one of the biggest things that the enemy attacks. That was the greatest commandment that Jesus gave us. To love the Lord your God with all your uh, heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Like that was the greatest commandment he gave us. And that's the one thing that pain attacks. Our relationships with God and our relationships with people. The third person you've gotta forgive is them. It's the people who hurt you. The person or the people who hurt you. Those are the people that we choose to release. Okay, and we're gonna have a prayer team up here after service that you can come and pray with. They'll take you through that process and pray with you. But take that, that step. 
Because honestly, and I don't mean any disrespect, but if you've been in pain for a long time, listen to me, you've tried your way and you're still here. Try his way. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there is another side. There is a healing and a wholeness that God desires for you to walk in, in your life, okay? Point number five, and I'm almost done. Worship in the middle. Worship in the middle. In our pain, we've got to choose to worship in the middle. Judah Smith wrote a book and it was called, How's Your Soul? Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. We're three parts. We are spirit, soul, and body. The soul part of us is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And he talked about in his book how, you know, pain and crazy situations can cause our soul to get out of whack, out of alignment, to go crazy. And he said, the one thing that brings your soul back home into proper alignment in your life is worship. Why? Because it's what we were created to do. I wanna encourage you in the middle of your pain to worship and give praise more than you ask questions. Because believe it or not, worship will become your weapon. It'll develop in you and it'll actually become your weapon. There, there were so many times in my deepest pain when I chose to worship instead of ask. I could never empathize with panic attacks. Um, you know, people would ask, you know, come and tell me they had panic attacks and I would say, oh man, that's crazy. I'm praying for you, bro. But I didn't know what that was until I had one last year in the middle of the night. For those of you who have had them, you feel like you're dying, right? You feel like you're dying. Your heart's beating, you're sweating, you're shaking uncontrollably. And then I had another one and then another one. And then I had one when I was driving down the highway and I had to be on the phone with Pastor Andy because I had somewhere to be, but I was shaking and I had to get somewhere and I couldn't pull over. I can remember those nights where God taught me something. It was in the middle of those panic attacks where I would just be like, like just down on my knees trying to just calm down. Uh, if you've ever been in it, you're breathing, you're... <sighs> And I remember the Lord saying, worship me. And I remember uh, facing my pain. I remember just, it was almost like I was looking the enemy in the eyes and, and, and the pain and the reality of the situation. And I remember lifting my hands towards heaven. And I remember saying, God, you are still good. And I love you and nothing will ever steal my affections for you. I'm all yours. And in the face of all this, you are a good, good father. And as I began to worship, I would sing like really old songs. Like my grandparents would love it. I'd sing really old songs and it brought my soul home. What am I saying? I'm saying worship in the middle. I'm saying that in the middle of your worst pain, when the enemy has got you exactly where he thinks, uh, exactly where he wants you, exactly where he thinks he's defeated you, what really shakes hell and disarms the enemy in your pain is in the face of it all, when you should be freaking out, you lift your hands to heaven and you say, God, you are still God. I set my eyes on you. There's no one beside you. I love you. Nothing's gonna steal my affections for you. And and I worship you in the middle. I was watching uh, over the fall, I was watching uh, Hurricane uh, Michael, Michael, okay, Hurricane Michael, and, uh, and it devastated the coast. Mexico Beach, a place where I love uh, to go. I love the beach. I could go there 30 days and not wanna come, come home. And uh, I remember watching the coverage of it, and I remember uh, watching these palm trees. And these palm trees... Man, just the wind. I mean, it was, I mean, over a hundred mile an hour winds and man, things were being destroyed. But these palm trees, they just stood and took the weight of the storm. And I was just waiting on them to break. I didn't even hear what they were saying anymore. I was just like, man, one of those palm trees is gonna break. <laughs> ADD. And man, they stood. Then the Lord took me to Psalm 92, 12 and um, Psalm 92, 12, and it says that the righteous will flourish like palm trees. The righteous, you know that God actually compares us to palm trees? So here's the deal, no matter what you're going through, 
Whatever storm you're in the middle of, you have a reason to worship because you may be bending under the pressure of your storm, but guess what? You're not broken. You have a reason to worship in the middle of it. Worship, Wor choose to worship. Turn on some hill song, sing a hymn, whatever, but worship in the face of it all. When you get the worst news, when, uh, the, the worst news, when you get the bad diagnosis, worship. Worship, disarm hell, man. Worship, it doesn't make sense to our soul, to our pain, in our mind, it doesn't make sense, but man, it makes sense to our spirit. It makes sense. It's what we were created to do. Um, last point, and I'm through. You guys still with me? Yeah. We're a little over, okay. Last point is pain plus purpose equals platform. Pain plus purpose equals platform. We need to understand some things before we go into this point. We may think that it was all for nothing. We may think that they left, they died, the wreck happened, the injury happened, the cancer happened, the rejection happened, the divorce happened, because that's just life. But that isn't true. Your painful experience is not some part of your story that you just wish you could tear the pages out of. That's the part of your story that God can actually birth your purpose out of. That's the part of your story that can actually become the platform that you stand on to bring people hope. It's that. It didn't happen for nothing. Listen to me. God doesn't waste pain. It's not just this thing you went through one time and that's a part of my story. No. There's so many people who have been through crazy situations in their life and they're still like, man, I don't know what my purpose is. Find it in your pain. Find it in your pain. Because in the midst of all that, in the midst of the healing process, God is building a platform for you brick by brick for you to stand on and bring hope to your world. And your world could be your school, your office, the grocery store. So many people wait on a stage to tell their story. Your life is a stage, man. Tell it everywhere you go. Your story will change other people's stories and it brings them hope. You wanna know why? Because they see people on the other side who have been through exactly what they're in the middle of and they see people who are healed and whole and in verse 12, happy and content and enjoying life. And enjoying life. Purpose is birthed out of our pain and God uses it. And it seems like when you're in the middle of it that your pain only has to do with you, doesn't it? But actually, that piece of the puzzle that didn't make sense, the thing that you thought just had to do with you, it actually had to do with bringing healing and hope to everyone around you. You didn't go through that for nothing. God can take that season and he makes a reason and he births purpose in you. And then it becomes your weapon to disarm hell, to disarm hell. So that you can step into your purpose. Your deepest pain can bring your greatest purpose. It's David, David, even if you're not church, man, you know, David and Goliath, it's that David, the man. He was redheaded like my sons. It's good looking. David's family overlooked him at a very young age. They didn't really believe in him. He fought a lion, he fought a bear, he fought a giant. Saul didn't believe in him when he went to fight a giant. Then after he killed the giant, Saul heard people singing uh, songs about David. He, this king that David loved became jealous and attempted to take David's life. All of that pain, all of that rejection, all of those people that never noticed him and overlooked him, all of that pain was just preparing him to be king. I think about two of my best friends, Jake and Amanda at our Jasper campus who lost not one, but two babies. Not one, but two in their late 20s and early 30s, 2014 and 2016. And you know, they do have hard days and they do have difficult times and man, they cry and they, they, they feel it. 
but they also don't sit in misery. They've actually taken their pain and allowed God to make a platform out of it. So now they're a part of organizations that support people who have lost children. They've led grief share small groups for people who have lost people in their life. Anybody who has ever lost a young child, I want them to meet Jake and Amanda because they are people who took what the devil meant to destroy them and break them with and allowed God to build a platform out of it. They stood up on it and said, okay, now this story is gonna change other people's stories. That's pain not wasted. Are you with me? I think about my buddy Jay Smeeks at the Jasper campus, 25 years old. He was diagnosed with stage four metastatic colon cancer. Instead of sitting in misery and depression, he like showed up at every serve day, like manual labor with a chemo drip, could, sometimes didn't have the energy to do it, but he did it. He went to every speaking engagement and told people, yeah, I've got this death sentence, but Jesus has changed my life and he can change yours too. As his life was ending, we rode around in the, in the truck together a lot of days. And as his life was ending, he started saying crazy things. He said, man, I'm, I know it sounds crazy, he said, but I'm thankful that God allowed me to go through this in my life. He said, cause Adam, look, look at these people who know Jesus. Look at my family on the front row. Just look, the devil threw a disease at me and now People know Jesus because of it. Pain not wasted. God births a reason and a purpose out of your painful season. You know, none of us like pain, and I'm through. But none of us like pain. But something really cool that maybe you didn't know, like Jesus didn't like pain either. You know what I'm saying? When he stubbed his toe, you know, I mean, he probably, well, he didn't cuss. I don't know what he said, but. <laughs> oh, my me. Uh, <laughs> it was crazy in uh, Luke 22, he was in a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And he was about to go to the cross and he was having this conversation with God. And basically you can go read it, but he said, man, <laughs> God, I don't really want to go through this pain. And it wasn't just the pain of the cross and being, it was the pain of like God was going to pour his, his daddy was going to pour his wrath out on him so he could pour his love out on everybody else. He was about to take the punishment for all sin of all humanity past, but that was about to fall on this perfect guy. And he's sitting here about in the garden of Gethsemane praying this about to endure all of that. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. And his capillaries began to burst and his sweat became as great drops of blood. Great drops of blood. I think the geography though is very, very important in this story. He was, in a, he was under so much pressure and about to endure this pain. But what's crazy is, is Gethsemane, the definition is oil press. And the way that an oil press works is that it applies pressure to oil paste to extract the oil. The more the pressure, the more the oil. You know, the Bible compares oil and it, the, the Bible compares oil and says that it is symbolic of the anointing of God. So many kings were anointed with oil. We anoint with oil. Could it be, see, Jesus was in under pressure, but literally in the, in the place of pressure. Could it be that out of your greatest pressure from your pain can come your greatest anointing? Could it be that out of your deepest, darkest pain could come your greatest purpose? Your greatest purpose. Pain plus purpose equals platform. I believe when we go through the healing process and then at the end of it, we realize there's a platform that we can stand on 
and bring hope to people. We realized that our purpose was birthed in that, that man, that season didn't make sense, but God made a reason for it. And all of these people who know Jesus now is the reason. See, the pain of Jesus, it disarmed hell and led to the salvation of many. Your pain can do the exact same thing. It can disarm hell over people's lives and lead to the salvation of many. That's what happens. I believe it's then and only then when we step into our purpose, when we begin to live in a healed place in complete forgiveness, where our soul is mended and healed and we can now speak with purpose and boldness from our pain. I believe it's then and only then that we can live, verse 12. That we can live, verse 12, where I've, I concluded that there's nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. The series is called would you relive the life you're living? Here's what you all deserve at every location. You deserve, no matter what you've been through, you deserve to want to relive the life you are living. Here's the deal. I've been through a lot. <laughs> I'd do it all again. Because of things like this, where I have the opportunity to bring hope to people. We can get to that place together. Let's bow in prayer.